Welcome back for another episode of the 5G Guys. I'm Wayne Smith, joined by my co-host, Dan McVaugh. Hey, Wayne, everybody. Thanks for coming back to another episode of the 5G Guys. Hey, before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, we've started a 5G Guys newsletter. Uh, every Friday in your inbox, we'll bring you the three or four most interesting technology stories uh, of the week. So if you haven't already, go to uh, 5GGuys.com and hit the subscribe to newsletter area, and we'll get that to you in your inbox every Friday. This episode, Wayne and I have um, a couple of guests on. This is First of all, this is our first time having two guests, so this will be fun. Um, but, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how in both of our practices, we help a lot of our customers with problems and how to expand their network to to enhance their networks and improve um, their networks for their customers. And this week, we have a couple of guests that um, have a really interesting use case um, around how they did this to address communication problems for public safety first responders in the schools in their area. So um, to start that off, uh, we have two guests with us this week. It's uh, Jeff Vaughn with Douglas County Sheriff's Office and Cody Martin with Castle Rock Microwave. We'll start off with Jeff at the front end here. So Jeff is uh, a Marine veteran uh, who also serves as the Radio Systems Administrator and Supervisor for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office in Douglas County, Colorado. He's been doing that for the last 27 years. Uh, he also serves in various leadership roles on numerous uh, public safety communications commissions, including the Department of Homeland Security, the FCC, and, and several regional and state uh, uh, positions in that role. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, Jeff. So tell us about the use case, um, you know, for you realizing the county had a public safety communications problem and how it turned into the case we're about ready to talk about. Yeah, so it's it's actually uh, we've had multiple incidents over the years, um, going all the way back to um, Columbine, unfortunately, uh, where we knew there that we had major issues with communications, uh, just in general, nobody could communicate to each other outside or inside buildings. Uh, we were we were involved, unfortunately, with the Arapaho uh, County High School shooting. Uh, we assisted with Bailey. Uh, there's there's been many use cases scenarios in the after action reports or hot watches uh, where communications was just a miserable failure, especially once you went inside the buildings. Um, so we've uh, we've been working really hard for years to try and address those issues. Uh, when when the uh, the final one for us here in the county that helped uh, really bring light to the project we're going to talk about uh, was at the STEM school. Uh, they happen to have a BDA or bi-directional amplifier uh, in the building already, um, and that allowed the response to be a lot more efficient and effective. Uh, so that was kind of the, the tipping point that, that showed, you know, it really validated that this is a valuable investment to the safety of our schools and, and the folks who are working or in the schools, uh, and that it really helps the response be a lot more efficient and effective. Um, so fortunately, um, we have really good commissioners and our, our uh, staff at the sheriff's office and all the law enforcement that was involved, as well as the fire departments and EMS, um, <clears throat> realized that th this was a high priority and our commissioners had set aside extra money uh, to help address communications issues as well as some of the other security issues uh, in all the schools here in Douglas County. And then we've been working in partnership uh, with schools to implement those. And then Castle Rock Microwave was our vendor that we brought in to help us manage and, and do all the work for the project. Great, well, that's a great segue to introduce our second guest, Cody Martin with Castle Rock Microwave. Uh, Cody has really been spending the bulk of his career helping to keep students, faculty, citizens and first responders alike all um, connected with improvement of critical network safety infrastructure. Um, in his role with Castle Rock Microwave, uh, they've been helping the public and private sector use wireless technology to bridge a digital divide to help with connectivity to, to address these kinds of pain points. So, um, so Cody, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So, so tell us a little bit more for our audience about yourself and Castle Rock Microwave and the types of projects that you guys are typically doing, then maybe transition into, you know, when Jeff and the sheriff's office reached out to you guys, how that first engagement went and, and kind of kick it off. Sure. Yeah. So Castle Rock Microwave is a premier systems integrator um, 
throughout Colorado and the mountain states focusing on, you know, critical connectivity. Um, so advanced network solutions um, can be used in, in all different types of, of ways. I think two of the most interesting things we're doing right now is helping cities and counties uh, track crimes in, in real time, uh, as well as helping utility companies um, secure the electric grid. So those are just two of the things that, that we're doing every single day. Um, when when Jeff and, and the, the county approached us with this uh, project, we, we have a very specific process that we, we call 3DS. Uh, it's a kind of a proprietary uh, process that we use to um, provide discovery uh, and then design uh, and then, of course, deployment. And then we wrap it all up with the support and service to, to ensure that we're understanding what the problems are that they're trying to achieve and that we're, you know, approaching it from the right, from the right perspective. Yeah. You know, I had a question, uh, I think for our listeners kind of explain the differences between public safety communications and commercial DAS, DAS or neutral host type, you know, communications. Um, well, basically the, the main, main differences is, uh, what kind of traffic is it carrying? Right. Um, public safety radio systems and, uh, cellular data networks they're very similar in their their network architectures and how they work everything's a radio uh everything has an ip address these days so you know it's uh it's it's basically just the, the real difference is which traffic is it carrying and what frequencies it's likely on um you know for us the uh, the public safety uh world it's it's certain radio frequencies and uh, different systems um, here in the metro area we have or five fairly large public safety networks, uh, and then the one statewide uh, radio network that we're a part of, uh, partnering with the state and many other locals. Yeah. No, that was, that was great, Jeff. And I, and I know I'll, I'll kind of feed you a couple of nuggets that I, I, I think would be great to understand. One of the big issues that I understand that you play a big role in, particularly in those commissions that you, you chair on and that you have leadership on is, is what's called interoperability. And I think that's one difference as well in the public safety area that commercial cellular doesn't have, which is commercial cellular, everybody's a competitor. Verizon and T-Mobile don't want to interoperate. They don't want to let each other's customers share that network. Now that could be changing in the future, but for you in the public safety spaces, it's the exact opposite, right? You want to make sure Douglas County, Arapahoe County, the state, even the federal agencies can all have their networks interop so that in an emergency, they can all communicate with multiple um, jurisdictions and agencies working together. Yes, is that's that right? correct. So, so the uh, radio network that we have, uh, ETRS is what we call it here for the statewide radio network. Um, that is a, a vast majority of all the public safety agencies, governmental agencies, all levels um, share that radio system. And then uh, we all share sites with each other. So, Douglas County radio sites are available to Arapahoe County, Elbert County, El Paso County, State Patrol, whoever as they're passing through. Um, you can restrict certain channels, we call them talk groups on that system, but you can restrict uh, their accesses uh, to some degree to help manage loading if needed. Uh, but for the most part, uh, everybody shares all their resources. Uh, so we can, we can provide the most effective communications uh, to our, our heroes, our first responders, uh, law enforcement, fire, EMS, uh, road and bridge. I mean, how important is a snowplow just a couple of weeks ago, right? If we can't get an ambulance or the cop yeah. car to you, can't really help you. So those guys are a vital piece as well, you know, uh, things like that. Got it. Got it. So, Cody, then, when this particular use case came up and uh, the sheriff's office reached out to you guys at Castle Rock, when you talked about your proprietary process, that first D, I think, was discovery. Tell us, tell us, start us off. So in this use case, what did the discovery look like? What does discovery even mean? And what did you guys find in your discovery? Sure, yeah. So w- one of the challenges that we continue to face, right, Dan, is is that we have more and more people trying to connect to more and more things wherever they are, right? It, that, that, that connectivity needs to be ubiquitous. So um, the first thing we did was try to understand, okay, what's your, what's your current state, right? What, what, what are, do the signal levels look like in your schools, in the locations where you need to have this, um, frankly, these communications need to work all the time, right? 
uh, especially when they need to work. So the the first step was really understanding, okay, what what is your baseline? Let's let's do some signal measurements. So we ended up walking the schools, doing signal measurements uh, at all of the areas within the schools to determine where the gaps are, right? Because there there are, um, you know, what we wanted to do is is in, certainly fill the gaps and make sure that there was at least 95% coverage, which is a, the standard for the ERCES public safety. Um, communication standards. So that was kind of the first process was understanding, you know, what, what the signal levels look like today, and then really designing, that's the second D in our 3DS process, was to design a solution that's going to help fill that gap, deliver the, the connectivity uh, requirements, and create the signal strength uh, that would be sufficient to support emergency communications. So what did you guys find, Cody? Um, how, how bad was the problem? Was it was it pretty bad? Was it just a small problem? What, what did it, you guys it was find? Yeah, that's thanks. Yeah, that's it was pretty bad. Um, you know, the security director and, and Jeff both, I think they had a, an inkling that there was going to be pretty bad. But once we, we got the results, um, it was very clear that, you know, we needed to, to help them take action on improving the, the signal strength and improving the system. So um, they, they agreed that it was going to require an upgrade uh, and basically um, a refresh, right, of the equipment to ensure that the, um, the, the amplifiers, the antennas, the, the radios themselves would be able to provide the coverage that was necessary uh, to ensure those, those communications worked when, when, when needed. So, so, Jeff, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about two, three schools? Like, how, 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 how big is this, did this project end up being? Uh, so, so when we first started looking, there was probably ninety uh, percent of our schools that we could not talk in effectively. Um, and when uh, Cody mentioned the ninety-five percent coverage, that's also in fire code. It's a mandate, uh, but it's an unfunded mandate. So a lot of places are not addressing that mandate, and uh, these these issues are are really big in in almost every large hardened type structure which all, almost all of our schools are, of course. That's high school, middle school, elementary schools, all of them. Um, so again, fortunately, you know, our leadership had the foresight to uh, address this problem, set aside that money to, to help fund this uh, project as well as some other projects to address security communications. And it even allowed us to uh, migrate the schools themselves over to our radio network. So we have more efficient communications there even and of course, when you're in a life safety situation, seconds could save lives, right? And having that direct communication ability between us and the school security and their response teams as well, um, you know, it, that's huge. And um, whether that's a, an active threat or it's a medical response, I mean, the sufficiency that we've been able to achieve through this project is just enormous. I think you keyed on something that's super critical. It's just not... Uh a law enforcement response, it's medical response too in the schools, being able to communicate that super efficiently and getting the help that they need uh, for all the kids out there. Yep, that's definitely a, a huge factor that, that helped us with this. And again, the fire codes, uh, you know, asked uh, or mandate that we should be doing this. But um, unfortunately, those those things are hard to enforce. I mean, um, a lot of them, it's, if it's an existing building, it doesn't really apply. But when they go and do an expansion to a certain percentage or square footage or types of material, then it does apply again. But again, the funding's usually not there. Uh, so it's a, it's a real hard task to keep up with. Yeah. And then, and so then as you guys took this on, Cody, uh, beyond discovery, then you, you had to actually make this happen. You had to design these systems. You had to deploy them. Who were some of the other stakeholders besides the sheriff's office and their team that were part of this process. Give us an idea, like what it all takes to pull this all together. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, we had facilities personnel, we had infrastructure personnel from from the school district, right? We had security uh, administrators and and you know faculty staff getting us access, right? Because we have to be uh, escorted to to these facilities, and uh, it was a you know it was a whole team effort. Of course, everybody. Uh, was was really helpful in making sure that we had the access that we needed and we were able to um, improve the uh, the system when we were replacing the, mm -hmm. the radios, when we're running the cable, when we're connecting the antennas. I mean, all that stuff needs to be supervised. 
Right. Um, so from, you know, from facility personnel to administrative personnel to, of course, the security folks as well. Right. And, and as Jeff mentioned, um, what really drives this from a regulatory standpoint is fire code. So did you also have to work this? I mean, the fire department, they're not part of your agency, right? Jeff? Uh, nope. Uh, we, we are on a shared system. We work very well together, always trying to coordinate communications. But yeah, they're, they're definitely a, a separate entity. And uh, their codes aren't always exactly what we uh, have for our stuff. But, you know, we, we, like I said, fortunately in this area, Douglas County, we all work very well together. And uh, it's actually, um, it's been a real blessing because it's opened my eyes to a lot of needs that I didn't know were out there from the law enforcement side of things. You know, I, I, I saw all that. I knew what that looked like. Then you start working with the fire side of the house and uh, it's, was come L on a couple of incidents. There was a little bitty fire called Hayman way back that, uh, at that time was the largest wildland fire in, in, uh, Colorado. But, uh, that really opened my eyes to a lot of the needs of fire departments and so on too, beyond just, well, once they get dispatched to a call, that's it. They don't really need radio. That's not true. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And then when we start going in doing exercises, uh, that's the other big part of, you know, these, uh, critical response, uh, active threat type responses. We do exercises pretty regular and it's law, it's fire, it's yeah. everybody together, you know, and that really helped us understand their needs, uh, as well as what we were trying to accomplish. And they're, they're similar, but not the same. So Cody, you, so did you guys have to work with multiple fire agencies? Did you have to work with I'm assuming that the school district crosses multiple jurisdictions as well. So maybe you had to deal with different cities and jurisdictions for, I don't know, permitting, things like that. Did you, is that part of your role as well? Yeah, that's, that's right, Dan. That was one of the challenges because the Douglas County school district is so large. It actually overlaps with several different uh, authorities that have jurisdictions. So between South Metro fire and Parker fire and Castle Rock fire, and there are a lot of different agencies um, that we had to work with and coordinate with to obviously get approvals, but also to um, come out and sign off on that permitting. Got it. So now that you're on the back end of this this big project or I, multiple projects, I don't know how it all came out, but um, from either of you guys, give us some takeaways. Like what were some of the things that some of the anecdotal impacts that it's, it's had? Um, Jeff, maybe for you from a public safety standpoint, uh, maybe Cody for you in terms of what you guys learned about it and how you've applied that to other use cases or other opportunities to help in this regard. So primarily for us, it's um, most of our schools have, have what you call an SRO school resource officer uh, that resides in that school. Uh, so first and foremost, now those guys are able to stay in, in good communications with everybody else all the time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it allowed us to actually bring our schools uh, themselves, the radios they use, onto the same radio network, uh, which achieved a lot of efficiencies in that uh, sense, because most schools, what they used to have was a single repeater that sat somewhere on or right next to the school. And then they had a bunch of little radios that you know worked off of that repeater, and every school was different. Nobody could really talk to each other very well. We couldn't talk to them. They couldn't talk to us, that whole nine yards, right? Uh, but from that, um, we've been able to achieve the efficiencies of utilizing frequencies they had that would work with our system um, and give them the cha all the channels they needed. Um, they're more involved, uh, you know, in the exercises we do now as well. Uh, and we were able to, to, through working on this, develop much better response plans together because we were already working on the communication side, which spins off into, hey, we're all working on this together. Who do we bring in to address this other need? Uh, and it, it's, it's not 100% done. We didn't get all the schools. Uh, we started with the high schools, got all the high schools done. We got uh, some of the charter as well. Uh, I believe most all the middles were done and then a handful of elementary. Uh, but one of the big key takeaways here is, to, in my eyes, is the awareness is there now. Everybody knows. So like when I mentioned about new schools coming or expansions are coming, they know to plan and include this as part of it. Whereas before communications was way afterthought, you know, till the building was done and you got in there and, Hey, we can't talk to anybody. Nobody thought about it. Right. Yeah. Cody, uh, here's a question for you. You know, technology changes rapidly. 
so when you guys do design, how do you, what's the lifespan of this kind of system? Because to hear Jeff talk, we're not quite done. We got some of it done. How do you future proof your designs? Uh, if you can even do that. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Wayne, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. You, there are certain applications and certain technologies that you kind of can future proof and build scalability into them. Um, you know, with, with these solutions, we're, we're able to see a good life cycle. I would say, you know, five to 10 years, I think is an expected, you know, an expected life cycle that you're going to get. 10 years is, uh, we have one at the justice center as yeah. well for the entire building there. We are on 10 years now and it's just coming mm -hmm. to an end of life where the manufacturer will not be supporting it within a few years. So we're just starting to look at upgrading that one now. There you go. So no, no, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, as with demand and, and usage, right, that can also change things. As you're adding more bits and bytes to, to a network, um, that can certainly create opportunities for congestion and, and maybe that life cycle needs to get upgraded a little bit sooner than that. But, you know, that, that also transitions us into the, the S part of our 3DS process, which is support, right? So, so anytime we are designing uh, a solution, we're deploying that solution, uh, we've done a proper discovery, we want to ensure that we're providing that ongoing service and support so that we are kind of aware of how a system is performing in real time uh, over the, the lifespan of a system. So these life cycle services is what we call them. When we are monitoring uh, systems, we're providing remote support, we're providing on-site support, uh, preventative maintenance uh, on a regular basis, right? We're just kind of um, making sure that, you know, it's kind of like keeping your car up to date with oil changes and things like that. We just really want to ensure that uh, it's not getting congested with all of these, you know, bits and bytes that are that are traversing the network. So we do regular health checkups. We start to identify and, and see trends and through our, you know, uh, analysis and reporting and, and the alerting that we do on these systems, we can kind of tell how, what the health looks like and, and, and put a good you know, pulse on how long we can expect the, the solution. And, and that's where the monitoring services you all provide for us in the school district uh, is critical. Uh, typically, there's before a major event would occur that's an issue, you have some type of data that's been showing up that kind of gives you a clue this is possibly coming, right? So you can get ready for it. And, uh, you know, with all of my team at the radio shop is monitoring that. Castle Rock's whole team is monitoring that. But we're all watching it together, and we're all ready to respond and help take care of that. You know, as soon as an issue does arise. And and you know, in my experience working on these systems, one thing that I've seen unfortunately a lot in the industry is there's a lot of folks that try to work on these systems that may not fully understand all of the the impacts of um, not only how they deploy it day one, but the importance of continuing yes. to monitor not just the system itself, but the the ecosystem around in the world is changing, right? People are turning up new radio systems all the time. New cell sites are going in. And oftentimes what I've seen is those can impact negatively the performance of the system that you guys built to no fault of the system you guys have built. And so you, in fact, by, by code, fire code and building code requires you inspect these systems on an annual basis, right, Cody? Yeah, that's right. Right. So, so I think it's important that last S you're talking about, I've seen too many times where people just build it and leave it and lo and behold, it wasn't working for three years and nobody knew it until there was a call out and there was a problem and all of a sudden first responders radios didn't work. So I almost feel like that last S in your process you're talking about, Cody, is almost the most important part of the process. I agree, Dan. I think that's a that's a great point, right? We we talked about when we were doing the discovery, uh, we did signal measurements. Um, what I didn't mention was after we we upgraded the system, we did signal measurements again, right? So now we have a basis for comparison uh, against the baseline. But then, to your point, every single year we're going back out there, we're we're doing those signal measurements on an ongoing basis. So with monitoring, with those signal measurements, right, with the preventative maintenance on the cables and the and the connectors themselves. We just have a very good understanding of the health of this system because, again, back to your point, there are a lot of um, intangibles. There are a lot of uh, unknown variables that are out of our control, right? These are not fixed variables in the environment. Has public safety broached the subject of 5D, you know, in some of the spectrum savings? How, how does that relate 
into you know what you guys are building and where you see the future of these public safety systems does 5g have a yeah, place data data in general has a huge place in uh, most of what we do um so you see the cars driving around they have their their computers in the car or an mdc uh they're using the cellular network uh 4g 5g uh used to be 3g uh, often we have to utilize multiple carriers to get the coverage throughout the county that we need. Uh, so we have a gateway that has multiple SIMs from multiple vendors that allows us to do that. Uh, uh, data is is a huge deal. Uh, but as Dan mentioned earlier, there's also a lot of companies out there that don't really know what they're doing. And when they put these things in, they can be very detrimental. Um, just one quick uh Example was many years ago, we had a BDA put in here that uh, near, nearby in Douglas County, I'm not going to say specifically we we're calling anybody out, um, but their electrician put it in. The guy had no clue about RF or how to properly optimize and balance and, you know, what's isolation or any of these things that have to be taken into consideration. They plugged that thing in and it took down six radio sites for over three hours on multiple public safety systems just because of where it was located. But, uh, you know, those are those are things that's it's critical. Yeah. As we as we kind of wrap up and thank you guys for your time, you know, Wayne and I have talked a lot about in episodes over the last two years of doing this podcast about how there's there's communication systems and technology in the world that most of us that aren't in the industry don't know exists. Today was a case study of, you know, a distributed antenna system specifically for public safety that we talked about and that impact. Cody, are there other areas that people may not know about that have similar infrastructure that help make the world around us work that you guys get involved with aside from, you know, in this case, Douglas County and a public safety radio network? What what else is out there that our audience should know about that, that you guys work on and that um, most of us probably don't know is going on behind the scenes? Yes. So, Dan, we, we really help, uh, you know, water utilities. Your water districts, right? Um, electrical co-ops and investor-owned utilities, uh, class one railroads, and then of course cities and municipalities um, with the public safety first responders being a, a big portion of that. Um, a lot of those agencies and a lot of those organizations have a lot of requirements around connectivity. The, the utility uh, and water districts need to pass SCADA traffic from their um, you know, uh, water pumps and their meters or smart meters. Uh, they need to have these, you know, wireless networks because fiber isn't everywhere we need it, right? And access to fiber, especially in the Rocky Mountains, right, isn't available everywhere we need it. So whether it's a, a city or a county trying to build out a broadband network to um, increase the uh, attrition of their citizens, to keep their citizens in place, right, that's going to help with tax revenue. So I've been very fortunate and, and lucky to be a part of some really neat projects projects. Uh, we've done some city municipal projects where we're bringing in connectivity to parks and to uh, water reservoirs and to different uh, areas, uh, you know, municipal buildings and judicial centers. But it's also helping to drive revenue at some of these parks and sports complexes where they can, you know, take payments uh, with, the, with Apple Pay or, or Google Pay or whatever it is. So a lot of these technologies, as you said, touch our lives in many different ways and it's it's hard for us to see it um but again you know it comes back to securing the electrical grid um you know tracking crimes in, in real time um and and also making sure that you have wi-fi on on the bus right so there, there, there's just a lot of different ways that uh, we're getting involved and and i'm again super fortunate to be surrounded by some really smart people who i mean collectively castle rock microwave has over 100 years experience and and wireless communications technology, which is which is hard to wow. believe. That's awesome. Well, listen, Jeff, Cody, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it was very enlightening. Hopefully uh, our listeners kind of got a, a good understanding of how this stuff really, where the rubber meets the road. So Cody, tell, tell our listeners how they can connect with you or Cast Rock Microwave. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Cody Martin. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Uh, you can reach out to sales at Castle Rock Microwave. Dot com, uh, or of course, you can just call us directly at 720-798-4520. Please connect with us on Facebook, <laughs> Castle Rock Microwave. Well, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for taking your time. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. 
Thanks for listening to the 5G Guys. For more resources and to connect with Dan and Wayne, check out their website at 5GGuys.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that follow button and share this episode with your friends and family. 